In this video, we'll see a tiny fraction of the diversity of annelids. The phylum includes something like 75 distinctive clades, traditionally ranked as families. We'll look at only nine of them. We'll organize them according to this simplified phylogeny, which is based on phylogenomic data. Most annelids seem to fall into two huge clades, Arantia and Sedentaria, that are sister taxa, and then there are a few other taxa outside of that, of which we'll see one, Ketopteridae. We've already looked at one member of Arantia, a Hesionid, and one member of Sedentaria, a Clitolate, in the annelid introduction video. Errant means traveling or moving around, and sedentary means not doing that so much. We'll start in Arantia with a Nereidid. Members of that group are often known as ragworms. The mouth is easily visible just ventral to the prostomium. It's surrounded by the first segment, the peristomium. In ventral view, you can see the two very large palps and the two short dorsal antennae at the very anterior end. The rest of the antenna-like structures at the anterior end are called tentacular cirri. You can see four big chunks of longitudinal muscle in this cross-section, two ventral and two dorsal. Just between the two ventral longitudinal muscles, you can see the ventral nerve cord. You can clearly identify the acicular chidae in this parapodium, as well as the neurochidae and the notochidae. Polynoids are usually known as scale worms because their dorsal surface is covered with a series of overlapping scales that are called elytri. You can see how the elytri overlap in this relaxed specimen. Elytri are modified dorsal cirri. Not all segments have elytri, and those that don't have elytri have normal dorsal cirri. The elytri form a shield over the dorsal part of the body, and there's a space between the elytri and the dorsal body wall. The dorsal body wall has a lot of cilia on it, and those cilia pump water from anterior to posterior, presumably for respiration. You can see that using a dye to mark the water.
The ventral nerve cord and the brain of scale worms contain a type of hemoglobin called neuroglobin, so they are red. Again, you can see acicule in the parapodia of scale worms, as well as neurochaetae and notochaetae. If you remove the anterior elytra, you can clearly see the red prostomium. The prostomium bears a long median antenna, two short lateral antennae, and a pair of ventral palps, but in this individual it looks like the left palp is missing. Scale worms capture prey with an irreversible proboscis that bears four sharp jaws.
In harmathoe, like in most other annelids, the eggs are shed from the salome to the outside through the nephridia pores. But in this species, they are shed to the space under the elytri. Embryos are brooded there until they are finally released as larvae. To get eggs into that space, the nephridia pore on each segment is extended into a tube like a little hose that is turned up and aims into that space between the dorsal body wall and the elytri. Many psyllid annelids undergo epitoky for reproduction. The normally bottom-dwelling worms swim to the water surface and mate there. Members of this species are also bioluminescent. You can see them at Colorado Lagoon in the summer. Go out to the dock there two or three days after the full moon, just after sunset, and you'll see a bunch of little green worms luminescing at the surface. This is a female, but I don't see a male attracted to her. But this female has definitely attracted a male who is swimming around her and probably releasing sperm. Dorvaleid annelids have a set of complex jaws, which you can see in this ventral view. This individual everted its proboscis when it was relaxed, showing off those complicated jaws. Now we'll look at some sedentarian annelids. Most of those that we have for this lab live in permanent or semi-permanent tubes. Serpulids make permanent tubes out of calcium carbonate.
They feed by sticking some prostomial appendages called radioles out of the tube. They use cilia on the radioles both to create a water current and to capture particles from it. One radiole is usually modified into an operculum to block the tube opening when they pull into it to avoid predators. Many tube-dwelling annelids spawn when removed from their tubes. This is a female. And this is a male. This is another serpulid, Salmacina tribranchiata. Adults reproduce asexually and form these clonal aggregations that can be tens of centimeters across with thousands and thousands of worms in them. and one more serpulid, Neodexiospira. Members of this clade of serpulids usually make a spiral tube. They brood their embryos either inside the tube or in the operculum. In this species, they brood in the operculum. You can see some white and red specks in this operculum. The red is from the eyes of larvae, and the white is calcium carbonate the larvae are mineralizing to prepare for making their adult tubes. Here are some larvae removed from the operculum. In cross-polarized light, the calcium carbonate in the larval calcium glands is birefringent. That calcium carbonate will be used to start building the adult tube once these larvae settle and metamorphose.
This is the Sabellarid Phragmatopoma, known as the Sandcastle Worm. They build tubes with sand grains carried to them by waves. These aggregations are formed by larvae settling together, not by asexual reproduction of adults. Again, they suspension feed using ciliated tentacles, though these look pretty different from those of serpulids. Sabellarids have an operculum too, though in this case it's made with very dark, heavy chidae from the anterior segments. On some segments, they have dorsal gills. The posterior end is turned anteriorly in the form of this anal tube. This is so that they can defecate out of the tube opening.
Spionids are often extremely abundant in soft sediment habitats. They have two palps that they use to capture food particles. Particles they don't eat, they often incorporate into their tube. This individual is a champion tube builder. Like Sabalarids, this spionid has dorsal gills on some segments.
Serratulids are complicated. This species has lots of tentacles used for deposit feeding at the anterior end, but also some gills which are hard to see in that tangle of tentacles on more posterior segments. You can see the head end on the top right here. Terabellids are often known as spaghetti worms after the many white tentacles they use for deposit feeding. They also usually have a pair of gills. In this species, those gills are branched. The gills are red when filled with blood, but green when they contract and push the blood back into the body.
Like spionids, terabellids can build tubes with particles they capture but don't eat. This one built most of a tube over about an hour. Here's that process sped up into three minutes. Though Ketopterids live in tubes, they are not part of the clade Sedentaria. This species feeds using a long pair of palps. I don't know what these eat in nature, but in the lab they certainly capture brine shrimp larvae very happily. I'm not sure if they're actually eating them, but I suspect that they are.